Carla Schwartz comes from Framingham, Massachusetts. She is a poet, a poetry filmmaker, a photographer, a lyricist, and a professional writer. Carla told me that she has been writing poems since she was a little girl. In third grade, she had a teacher who let her pace the radiators when she was done solving problems at her desk. And so she stated while she paced radiators, she composed poems and produced her first book of poetry at the age of eight. Since then, she has continued on with writing poetry and she is published in a number of journals. She has read her work in the United States and Canada and Australia. And Carla, when asked about reading poetry compared with having her poems and books as well as for the work of other poets noted, when I share my poetry with other listeners, two things happen. I can hear the audience's responses to my work, which is gratifying from the perspective of reaching someone else, and something else happens. Hearing such an audience response generally inspires me to try to reach the audience even more. Or if I don't hear a response, I try to figure out what I can do differently to evoke one. The same goes when I'm listening to the poetry of others. There are key moments of resonance that sometimes I just won't get from the page. She has just published her first book of poetry, Mother, One More Thing, and she has been on local tour reading her book, and she is here to share some of the poetry from that book as well. And so I'd like to ask you all to give her a warm welcome here to share some of her poetry. Carla Schwartz. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I'm going to start this morning with a poem that is uh, not so um, not so direct, but um, a lot of the poems in this book are written toward, uh, directed toward from the narrator toward her mother or about a mother, or informed some way by the existence of a mother. And this one is one of those. It's called "In the Cafe." If I don't read Kay's email while working in a cafe today, then soft wind on my face. If the note isn't prefaced by her declination of my invitation, then alternator current. The fireplace calls liar when I pass by. The unlit sculpture slumped in its char. Show us your heart, a beach stone. Show us your smile, a coiled ribbon. Love is a blouse of dismissed calls. It flatters. What island are we from that with just two of us we don't see each other a nanosecond is only as big as a pencil if the mouth has no brain behind it then blueberries we have no reason to leave so we stay if Kay's father isn't in hospital, monarch butterfly. The fire sculpture is stacked, waiting for Kay. And if tears, then mother. Kay proposes bitter, and I say, not bitter. A bear trading a paper flower for a newspaper. Raw honey, clover honey orange blossom. If not my mother, then wipe tears from the face of a woman typing in a cafe. If I call, then dead woodchuck, show me the tissues. Show me the tissues. 
this, um, this next poem that I'm going to read to you is uh, called Daily Call, and it's again spoken from the narrator to her mother, who might resemble my mother. <laughs> you would be calling me out of the cold water today, telling me to buy a new car, as you did 15 years ago, before I bought the Honda. I would be telling you, it only has 235,000. And if I just replace the leaking fuel lines, it will last to 300 at least. You would parry with side airbags and anti-lock brakes. I still regret not having changed the timing gear in the Chevelle. Just then, you would lament, upset, my face is cut, my eye bruised, my legs, my palm, and introduce me. This is my daughter. She fell off her bike. The subtext reads, she doesn't usually look like this. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. Forgive her. <laughs> Not buying into the healing powers of a cold pond, you would insist I will get sick. I can't call to say I won't let go of the Honda because you helped me buy it and you're not here anymore. You, star of the showroom, who knew how to say no, to walk away from what you didn't want. <laughs> so this next poem, I write a number of poems about swimming. You've already heard about swimming in that last poem. This is another one, it's a, it's a story swimming poem. It's called Night Swim. After a day's work at the home office, after packing the car with camping gear, after the long drive slowed by traffic, after pulling into the campground and snagging the last spot on the pond, after the hour it takes to park and set up the tent in the darkening night, the dripping rain. After finally eating what would constitute dinner, four carrots with hummus while seated in the driver's seat of my parked car. After a day of not even stretching, after gathering my swim gear clothing and towel, headlamp affixed. I step down the steep, root-strewn path that must lead to the pond. At the water, in the almost pure dark, the sky still drizzles. Before stepping in, I strip and don my goggles, cap, and fins. Before I set out, I make a mental note of my entry point and its surroundings. A big secluded rock, a small cove, an opening in the trees. There is no moon. My splashing strokes, the birds, and the constant drip. By the time I am ready to stop swimming, the sky is clear, the Big Dipper revealed. A Venus peers down at the lone nude swimming in the dark. After I think I'm nearing my entry point, after trying one cove and the next, after every opening in the trees looks like the other, after swimming in and out of each cove, after approaching every big rock twice to find them blocked by dead wood. Wrong. 
Grasses, wrong. Other stones, wrong. All the while swimming, a repetition of coves. After wishing for my glasses and my suit, after considering a cry for help, could I spend the night on a rock or sleep in the shallows? Do the turtles sleep and the fish, or do they nibble all night? Should I swim to a beach and walk out on the road naked without light? I am Venus without her shell, only fins. Would I purse my coy smile if caught? <laughs> So I have a number of poems in this book that mention fruit, and in particular, a couple of poems about raspberries and a couple about peaches, and this is one of them. It is called A History of Raspberries. Francis lived in a little house between Route 9 and the Pike. She had been there 40 years, th through two kids, grown and gone, Husband, dead. Cigarette habit, dead. But her plantings thrived. She was thinning raspberries one year and offered me some. I made a place for these to compete with my wild blacks, which I could take or leave. When I lived in Vermont, I planted raspberries in front of the bathtub Mary. I didn't know what the nuns next door thought about that, but those berries were good. It took three years before the first berries arrived, one October, just barely before the first frost. In November, I put two soft, plump ones in a silver cardboard ring box to bring to my mother, sick in hospital. Her eyes lit on them as if they were holiday ornaments or truffles or cherry stones on the half shell. Now, Francis is dead of lung cancer, mom leukemia. I get a summer and fall crop of raspberries. I had berries into December this year. I still have the red stained box. Each bite, a sweet tart burst. Francis, my mother, bathtub Mary. And this next poem is also about my mother. Um, it's called Last Glass of Orange Juice. After she refused the hospital ice, not believing it to be filtered. After she spilled her fiction of my pregnancy on all her friends. After the hospital sent her home to die. After she stopped eating almost altogether, but before the hope of recovery eluded us in stealth I walked into her room with my morning juice, which glowed for her as if lit from within. And forgetting she was about to die, she smiled up and took a sip. And actually, 13. I'm going to read. The next poem I'm going to read is um, called In Defense of Peaches. My mother tied her socks to the peach tree in front of her house. I'm guessing she took sweaty ones off her feet one day or specially donned old ones and hung them and an old shirt to scare away squirrels and rabbits, maybe after reading about it somewhere, better than fox urine for sure. The socks still hang on the tree, larva lollipops. 
None of us has thought to press nose to cloth and inhale. That was her last wish, to go outside. Let whatever of mom still imbues remain and hang there year round like her clay bells. The other day, under my peach tree, there were four hard ones shaken down and chewed as best a green stone can be. She um, must have been a squirrel with a bad memory, taking a bite of one and a next, leaving the unfinished to ferment. That same day, I discovered my shoe was lucky. Lost twice in three months, first on a mountain, next on a road. Maybe I should nestle those shoes in the crook of the peach to fend off the wildlife. Maybe my mother's climbing shoes will do. Maybe this year I will be lucky in peaches. Now I'm going to change a little tack here. Um, This is called Addressing What's Broken. I wish I were good with tools so that when the stove timer doesn't keep time anymore, I would know how to pull off the knob and recoil the spring or set it straight just so, so that when I turn the knob, I can depend on the ticking of minutes, the quiet panting, until the annoying mechanical buzz saws against the silence. I wish, too, I could find my refrigerator model number and know how to replace the door gasket when it arrives. For now, I am good with duct tape. <laughs> it holds two doors kissing when magnets no longer attract. And let's see. My next poem I'm going to read is a riff on the word knock. It's called Knock Off. When you say, wouldn't it be better if you said, or I saw your disappointment and felt cornered since I have a natural pro proclivity not to hurt, I hear you saying, knock it off. The week of the marathon bombs, we were all emotional. The dead and injured couldn't say, knock it off. This was no joke. Once you knocked my socks off, I might not have noticed, but love came knocking, loud, insistent bursts. Sometimes you encouraged me to knock them dead if my confidence waned. Once, I knocked my ankle into a cinder block when I fell through a hole in your porch. Defending your house, you knocked me down a notch, labeled me accident prone. You wanted to knock sense into me, teach me knock it off. Your school of hard knocks. Teacher, I have a question. Love doesn't make sense. When a woman accidentally becomes pregnant, she's knocked up. I swell up with feeling when you tell me not to feel or how to feel or what not to say or if I do say, how to say it. You wanted the cheap knockoff feelings the yes, sir, that's right, whatever you say. Like the Walmart cashier when you purchased a knockoff scarf. 
So I think I have time for one more, right? Just can, yes. Okay. So I'm going to finish with um, page 63. I'm going to finish with a poem that's in three parts, but it's not that long, and um, it's called Shrimp. One. We lived in a slab house, shingled and dark. We were renting back then. Mommy painted us. My blue umbrella was satin, just the right size for my hands. It was not really for rain, more a parasol. Powder blue umbrella in hand, I started to cross the street to Gina's. Two. I remember lying in the driveway, mommy waiting impatiently for the ambulance that took forever then mommy holding my hand, then the wheelchair, the hospital, the teeth shaken out of me, being carried everywhere for a week before I regained my balance and the get well cards from nursery school. Later, the visit to the doctor, supposed to check my hearing, who put his hand so deep I had to bury the memory. Three. I never liked shrimp growing up. I thought it was because mommy only cooked it frozen and it smelled like a frozen toilet. <laughs> Later, mom said I used to love shrimp and that the day I was hit by the car, I threw it up on the driveway and after that, I wouldn't eat shrimp again. It was a long time before I knew shrimp didn't have to stink. I never told mom about the bad doctor. By the time I remembered, I knew what it smelled like, and I didn't know what I remembered. Thank you very much. There's a storm outside your door If there's a pain you can't endure If there is nothing of which you're sure Then I am yours If you are lost, if you are old you are tossed out in the cold If your last hope has been sold Then I am yours I am yours You are mine As it's been through all time I am yours, you are mine And should you doubt that I am there If you cry out in your despair What's it all about that's your first prayer and you are mine I am yours You are mine As it's been Through all time I am yours You are mine I am yours Thank you. Mom, with her head in her hands, on the toilet, not bothering to close the door. Trembling lips grip a plastic tube. She drags each breath up a steeper hill. Minutes after the breathing treatment, mom falls asleep. 
I leave without waking her for dancing with the stars. The family room with no hospital bed or oxygen tank. A realtor calls it an open space. Thank you. Miso soup isn't at its best in plastic. The bowl and spoon, a subtle message from management. You are less than special, prone to break things, not worth real crockery. Or more, maybe they were saying, we're cheap. The miniature Japanese teacup, rough orange clay, is chipped. The tea is already cold, and the waiter is inexperienced, English not even his second language. Oh, the kitchen is slow, and the customers are complaining. But it smells spicy and exotic in here, warm compared to the sidewalk. There are people keeping a low chatter going above the funkadelic music. I might see a face I know, or at least someone who gives me hope. Maybe sit here at the bar and strike up a conversation. Even when is winter ever going to end, or at least the sun is shining, would be something. Maybe it's just a quick lunch and head back to the office day, but I was hoping to be transformed, somehow different from my morning sulk. My feeling lonely in a crowd disposition is completely my own making, for I want so much, and the space where it will live is an open, open cavern of hope and anticipation. strong 